I'm just going to pull up my 168 slides. <laughs> um, don't worry, we're, we're only going to devote half of today to the slides. So 168 slides in 60 minutes. What's that math? 15 seconds per slide. Good. Excellent. <laughs> um, all right, welcome back, everybody. Um, so this is the, uh, the agenda for today. Basically, I'll just go over a couple admin stuff in the next slide. Then we'll do a little bit of like a, maybe maybe you'll, let's like look at some of those projects that, that that some of you shared on the Slack channel, and I will also uh, maybe like show off a few cool projects, uh, things that are in the spirit of the class, you know, things that we want to kind of um, themes that we want to explore in, in building this this autonomous artist, and um, basically the the main event, let's call it is, or two main events rather, is I want to do a, basically a demo of all of the interactive tools that we have that are going to be all candidates for use in building our autonomous artist, right? Um, and, uh, and then depending on how much time we have, hopefully we'll, I actually flip-flop the order. I was going to do this in the beginning, but, but, but then I kind of decided to do it the other way around. We'll kind of talk about generative models, um, which is going to be the core element, I think, of our spirit, um, the spirit that we're going to create. And um, yeah, and then I'll talk about what we'll do next week, like later today. Okay, so just a few admin things. Oh, yes, uh, the first thing I want to do is I want to pass around a download that I want everyone to have. And actually, those of you who already took class with me last semester should already have this. It's the ML4A OFX um, applications for Mac. Um, everyone else, I want to get this to you, and I think basically the easiest way is um, it'll take a little while for it to pass around, so I'm thinking maybe to either pass around this hard drive or um, to let me just get this, or, or also we can use uh, maybe AirDrop. Uh, maybe some of you who, okay, so for those of you who do not have this, which is anyone who didn't take class with me last semester, um, please go to your AirDrop and let's see if we can just get this to you this way. Um, anyone see their computers here? Oh, but I, I'm stupid because I, <laughs> but I actually have to do it from here. Okay, hang on a second. So, ah, okay, I screwed myself up here. Let me first put it on this hard drive. So what we'll do is maybe we'll pass around the hard drive and then people can just copy it from the hard drive as we go. And for anyone who happens to be an airdrop, that might also be convenient. So let me just quickly put it on the hard drive. And the download is going to be called, I'll show you just in a second. I'm gonna, okay. Hang on just a moment. So we'll put this on here. And, and then I'm going to pass around, I'll start going this way, uh, to Ilana, right? Okay, hang on a second. All right. Um, so the file that you want to grab is this file right here. I'll show you in a moment. As soon as the hard drive, this pulls up, it's called ml4a-ofx.zip. And um, please don't take any of the other stuff. <laughs> um, yeah, this is the file that you want. Okay, so I'm gonna pass this around. Okay, I'll go start over here. Okay, and then maybe we can skip for a few. Uh, oh, I forgot to also put it. Wait, let me let me actually grab it first over here. <laughs> sorry, I'm very I'm very sorry. Hold on a second. I'm going to put it on this computer and then try to transfer it to some of you on AirDrop. Okay, hang on just tight. Is there more in that folder than what's on the GitHub repo? Uh, it's, it's, it is in the, the GitHub repo, but these are already built. Before. So if you downloaded the release, then you have it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this will be some stuff that we'll show basically later today. Um, okay. So now, okay, now you can start passing this around. And how many, who sees themselves, like, I'm going to just start passing it randomly to people that, are, that happen to show up in AirDrop. Um, William, I see you, yeah? Let me send this to you. 
Okay. Yang Yang. Is this your computer? I had it. Huh? Oh, you have it. Now, of course. All right, all right, all right. Um, near? Is she here? I'm here. Ah, yep. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to pass it to you through AirDrop. Oh, there, there you are. Uh, Matt, is this someone's book here? Yeah? Matt? No? Uh, Marianne? No? Okay. Uh, Roland, do you, do you have them? No, yeah, I don't think you do. Right. Okay, I'm going to send it to you and AirDrop. So this will just kind of speed things up. Oh, I think I lost you. Where did you go? Oh, there you are, Roland. Um, maybe also Jenna? Oh, you should have them already, I think, right? Probably from last, I can, yeah, if you don't, then I can send it to you. Effie? Is that here? Yeah, I'll send it to you here. Um, Abby? Are you here? Oh, yeah, I'm going to send it to you. Um, Azalea, also. So basically, like, if you, huh? Oh, yeah, yeah. Where are you? I don't see. Ah, yes. Anyone else see themselves here? One. One. That's quite a username. One. <laughs> um, does anyone else see themselves? Where are you? Bottom left, Kai. Yeah. <clears throat> Whose computer? This is great. That's a great username. You you do already have it. Okay. It's a great great name. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, everyone else like it's not urgent. Like in about thirty minutes, we'll we'll try to use them. So um, if you if you uh, the the disk is coming around, so just grab that and then we'll kind of go through it. And in the meantime, I'm gonna start in the slides. Okay, so back we go. Um, is anyone not yet on the Slack Slack group? Everyone's a Slacker? Yeah? Please uh, join the Slack group. Go to ml4a.github.io and then join the Slack group and then message me on it and then I will add you to our group. Yep. Everyone else is on it, yeah? We're all Slackers here. Um, okay, a few other things. Um, some of you uh, already had this from a few weeks ago. Most of you should have received an email from Runway yesterday. Did, did everyone receive that? So you're all now in the beta beta program, the beta testers. Um, so you're all now in the beta testers for Runway. Uh, just down, you you should already have it, Zara. I think. Yeah. It's the yeah the download. Yeah. Um, so everyone should should already be uh, so so uh, so basically just sign up for Runway and then at some point probably next week we'll do a uh, so everyone's good everyone already has it that's excellent okay so uh, so yeah next week probably and actually maybe also tomorrow at AI Lab I'm gonna do some tutorials with Runway so you guys can start to use that um, did you have a question yeah we haven't gotten that to email you or just the developer. Oh uh, yeah, you can e either way. Um, uh, you you didn't get it. You might have gotten it a few weeks ago if you signed up for it. So some of, uh, he said that some of you already had invitations. But yeah, if you didn't, then then message one or both of us. Yeah, I think we'll definitely give it to you. Can you use virtual? Sorry. Yeah. yeah. Can you oh. Virtual? You no, know, but this this will actually be the the new runway, the no, beta. No, but if you use the last one, you should have got an invitation like a month ago. Yeah. 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 That's correct. And the new version is 0 0.2.2, I think. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Did the download fail? Uh, okay. Yeah, that's fine also. Um, okay, so then, so that basically, I think tomorrow, I'm going to send an email about this today. We'll, we'll do some runway stuff um, tomorrow at AI Lab. Really good news is that in the new version, which, which Chris says should be released today, I hope, it will finally have the um, support for external GPU. So basically, you can just run on any computer that's running Runway, use external GPUs from, from their servers, basically. So that's going to be really, really, really awesome. And, um, and office hours. So I mentioned this last week, but I already have the calendar thing running. And actually, I quite like it. It's so nice and organized. I should have done it last semester. <laughs> Uh, but um, but yeah, so my office hours, I put them down on Wednesdays, 1 to 7. I might maybe just 
make them Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and you can sign up whenever because I'm more or less just in the office all the time. So you can come visit me and tell me what you're planning. And then basically, it's hard to believe this, but the class is over in five weeks from today, right? Is that correct? Um, so that means that we're, we're already, we're already, like imagine this was a 14 week class, we're already at week nine. So that means that we're, that's the way you should think of this class, like we're thrown into the deep end. We're going to start doing, we're going to start making stuff next week, basically. Uh, we'll, we'll be making stuff today, but mostly as demonstration. And next week we're actually going to start build, uh, planning towards the, towards the final project. And the last thing I wanted to ask is, uh, this is a toss-up question for anyone who's, who's doing a lot of processing P5 stuff. Who knows the best way to send images between computers in processing or in P5 over a network? Socket. Socket? Can you do it in processing? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah, but I would recommend Siphon. But Siphon, does it do network it's support? NDI. Sorry? NDI. NDI? Yeah, it's a network Siphon. Okay, okay. Someone after class can show me this, maybe? Uh, this would be ideal. I'd like to set something up. So okay, so maybe like let's remember to regroup and maybe show me. Okay, great. Now, uh, oh yeah, and I, I guess I just want to mention like the computer here to the right. I'm uh, setting it up. It's very exciting. We have a lot of the like a lot of the like Runway backend. All the models that we want to use are are kind of more or less functional right now. And uh, in the next week or so, I'm hoping to figure out maybe some sort of an SSH plan. So for people who want to like start training stuff, we're all going to train something together in these weeks. Um, so, so you're all going to definitely be exposed to this, this uh, monstrous computer at some point. Um, at some point, maybe I'll also bring it to AI Lab. It's kind of immobile, but I don't know. One floor, we could probably move it. Um, okay, cool. So now, uh, again, as a reminder, we're, we're going to be building a, an autonomous artificial artist. And that is, ultimately, it's this. It's basically like a generative model that lives in the cloud that's mediated by a bunch of really awesome like crypto-economic crypto ideas. But in this class, we're going to tone it down a little bit and get rid of the crypto stuff just because it's out of scope for this class and the school, ultimately. Um, and today, we're going to whittle it down even more and now talk about some of the building blocks. And the two things I'm, I'm hoping to get in today, although it's, it's probably not likely that we'll finish both of them, so it'll probably like spill over into next week. But um, the first thing will be actually on the right here, which will be um, showing you guys how to do some of the interactivity stuff. For those of you who were in my class last semester, we, we did a lot of this stuff. There's been some updates, so, so maybe... Um, so at least uh, you'll get some fresh stuff. For those of you who were not in my class, this will be a deep dive into the world of interactive machine learning. We're going to hopefully have interactive elements within the installation that we build. Um, it's going to be something of a Frankenstein, you know, maybe, or maybe like a, another analogy is, what's those uh, Rube Goldberg devices? So maybe someone builds a thing that drops a ball that, you know, goes down the ramp and then hits somebody else's installation down the other side of the room and that causes some sort of interaction and then basically it's going to end up being some sort of a Frankenstein of multiple interactive like uh, elements I guess and then the, the other thing that I want to do and this will again like I don't know how much time we'll have for this today so it might might spill over into next week but basically introduce you to generative models and how they actually work uh, like how they look from the top down perspective What's like think of, like um, maybe trying to give you a sort of almost like an API because we're gonna build one of these together and then hopefully we're gonna try to figure out ways of interacting with it. Okay. So uh, and but before we do any of that, I want to actually uh, review some of the. I think there's like you might want to find the chairs. <laughs> um, um, so let's talk about some of the uh, collaborative artwork pieces that, that um, a few of you found and shared on the Slack group. Um, so I, I, a few, uh, like I wanted to actually go into the, I don't have Slack here, right, of course. So let me just quickly switch into this computer and open up Slack. Okay. Oops. 
There we go. Okay. So th this is something cool I wanted to share. This is um, so Zara sh uh, shared this the Google Quick Draw, which I totally forgot about. Um, who knows what the Google, Google Quick Draw data set is? Right, so Google Quick Draw what, uh, was a data set that was um, let's put this here. So it was it was a data set that was collected by Google of tons and tons of uh, drawings by people in this app that they released, right? And uh, one of the really cool things that I was reminded of today, uh, which I wanted to share, is this website, uh, which basically tries to analyze all these drawings in aggregate, and it's and it's something of a, uh, you know, trying to get into the like the conscious mind of the world, like how we perceive objects and we draw them, right? So and then actually, there's also a blog post that Google wrote around. Uh, wrote about it, this is actually based off that. So this is some of those drawings. These are happy faces, I guess, or what is this? Uh, or no, these are just random drawings, I guess. So f this is how people draw in the app, right? So this is a snowflake, right? Um, and how people draw faces, right? These are just random samples, right? But things start to get really interesting when you start to look at them in aggregate, right? So and so many overlays, like the web is totally broken, right? Like, how do we get rid of all this? Right, ah, there we go, okay. So yeah, if you overlay the drawings, you'll start to see <coughs> interesting patterns emerge between different countries. So for whatever reason, people draw chairs facing left in South Korea, and, but center in Brazil. Like, who, who knows why that is? It's so <laughs> interesting. There's another, there's another, this, this was made note of in here, down here. People always draw fish. It, where is the fish? Yeah. In India and in Japan, fish are consistently drawn facing left. And in the rest of the world, it's like kind of undecided. Right? I understand there's a reason for this in Japan, is that fish have to always be served with the head facing left. Right? That's, that's my understanding. In India, I have no idea. Like, it doesn't make any sense. But uh, also in Japan and Taiwan, snowmen always have two segments. But everywhere else, in the civilized world, we have three always. <laughs> so, um, watermelons, just a big circle. Telephones. Um, teddy bears. Teddy bear in Japan. What's the deal? Oh, teddy bears have a little bit of a manga thing going on. Apparently, in Japan and Korea, their heads are bigger, right? Their heads are bigger. Ice cream cones. Uh, oh. What's the deal? Ice cream cone, always with a ball on top, except in Italy, Sweden, and Hungary, where scoops are side by side. It's really, really interesting stuff emerges in the, in the patterns. <clears throat> Flip-flops in Brazil are apparently kind of weird. What's the deal? Prevailing way of thinking about flip flops. I'm not sure I understand this I one. Think, actually. As a Brazilian, I think I think it's like <laughs> I think it's like you have a Vaiana, so it's like it's always like this, and in the rest of the world, maybe you can have like other types of. Oh, like like it always does yes, this. Yes, just uh, because it's like the okay. default, and then the other places maybe you have like different. I got you. All right. I don't know. What else is going on here? Boomerangs. Australians always draw boomerangs with the tip upwards. A bear. So, all right, well, the idea is that I don't want to get too caught up. This, these, I shared the links here, um, so you can definitely, like, look at these. Oh, this is great, yeah, power outlets. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, like, these are, oh, and then actually the... This one, the Doodle Maps, has T-Sneez of all of these, right? So we can look at, like, for example, oh, yoga. This will be great. Okay, yoga. This is organized by similarity. So we can kind of, like, go into one. <laughs> it's just floating, <laughs> floating yoga people. <laughs> and they're organized by similarity, so, like, we can find clusters. So maybe like, but how do you like, you 
Wow. This is great, right? <laughs> Maybe the 2D one is a little more reasonable. Ah, yes, okay, that's a little more reasonable. So here they all are on mats. <laughs> this is my favorite. <laughs> that's a three-legged dog, right? Who does yoga? <laughs> This is the, what is that, the, lotus. sorry? Lotus. Lotus, yes, lotus position. So yeah, this is, this is all really cool. Like, like, aggregate statistics are always very, very interesting, aren't they? So then another cool thing that we can maybe look at is, Yang, what is this draw on the moon? Uh, it's, uh, it's everybody uh, contributes uh, one little graphic or something on the moon. Uh huh. Yeah. This is a documentary, and uh, you can just browse the moon, 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 moon com, and you will see the drawing. Oh, so that's what Olaf Raleigh looks like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, I don't have sound here. My computer is dreadfully slow. <clears throat> okay, something's not functioning with my sound. That's okay. Anyway, I encourage everyone to look at these. It's, it seems very, seems very interesting. Okay, so now let's go back to the slides. Okay. Top-notch organization I have here. Um, so, okay, um, okay. So what we want to do now is I want to basically do a very quick review of neural networks. You know, we kind of introduced them last week. We don't have to understand them at a very, very, um, at a very high level. Oh, sorry, at a very low level. We'll kind of understand them abstractly, and then what we're going to do is we're going to get into this interactive machine learning stuff. Um, did we do this memor memorization exercise last week? Did I introduce this? Okay, good. So basically, I think you guys saw this in my, my last class, maybe not? Yeah. So here's the idea. Um, check, out, check, out, check out this text on the, on the screen right now. Um, I want you, I'm going to give you all one minute to memorize it. And then um, basically, if you can rewrite 50% of it, let's say, after one minute of looking at it, You'll pass the class. Um, otherwise, <laughs> sorry. Um, so, okay, go. One minute. One letter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, 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 no collaboration. None of this. Uh, um, so, so memorize that, right? Okay. C ninety eight. C ninety eight. C ninety eight. Seventy two. Okay. Obviously, this would be very, very difficult, right? But if I showed you the same, uh, same thing here. And I ask you to memorize this, and then after one minute, try to recreate it. Um, how many of you think you could probably do it? Do a good job, like fifty percent of it. Okay. Now, but but why? Like, I mean, it's the same number of characters. It's the same thing. It's just you know, it's a bunch of characters. Same number as the last one, but this seems so much more approachable, right? And obviously, like the reason is that you're you're forming patterns, right? You're kind of seeing these implicit patterns that aren't written down explicitly, but you can see a sort of pattern here. And, you know, there's, there's broken parts in the pattern, you know, random characters thrown in. But what you're doing is you're, you're forming a, a representation in your mind that basically makes you memorize much less information than you would otherwise need to do. And, um, and so this is kind of how you make sense of the world, right? You find these patterns or features and then form these mental approximations that take these patterns and kind of, you know, simplify the world a little bit, right? So it turns out that this is a good proxy for how machine learning actually works. It's also trying to reduce the amount of information that it's being given into something much more manageable that can be memorized uh, by, a, by a simple, you know, by a, by a smaller, you know, by a smaller data structure of sorts. And then we can do interesting things once we have that, right? 
So how would, how would that actually be done in machine learning, right? I showed you this diagram uh, uh, last week that shows you the, the basic idea of supervised machine learning. We're trying to learn a function that can, can, um, can give us a relationship between a data set and some sort of a variable, that, like a dependent variable, right? Something that we're trying to learn about a particular data point. And the way that F works is basically trying to do exactly what we just saw in the last slide. It forms some, some uh, representation of the data X, which is much, much more compact and has the uh, presence of meaningful, high-level patterns and their abstractions, you know, abstractions of, of, uh, of that data in the form of patterns, right? And, um, and we're not going to learn about what, we're not going to take a look at gradient descent in this class because it's a little bit out of scope, but as I said, if you want to know more about gradient descent, there's a chapter of it in ML4A, and also the second or third lecture, I forget which one, second or third lecture of, of last um, semester's class has, has like a long lecture about how gradient descent works. But basically the idea is using gradient descent, we're able to locate patterns, um, form, uh, you know, and then take the data, this X, right, and abstract away from the raw data into a set of patterns and the presence of those patterns in different parts of, uh, of the data, like an image, let's say. And then this actually makes the task of something like classification much more manageable. Right? So um, a few, so two use cases for this pipeline, um, image classification, which is one that, that is kind of the standard one. So we'll learn about how image classification works. Um, you know, dog, cat, and so on. Um, and regression, which is same thing, except except the amount, uh, it's sort of like, a, instead of discrete categories, you have some amount of something, right? You can, a continuous value, like a slider. So maybe you can predict the amount of snow in a data set, right? Um, now, uh, this is all mediated by neural networks. Like I said, we're, we're not going to look at the mechanics of these today just because it's a bit out of scope. But neural networks are kind of the workhorses in most of the machine learning that we do. And um, they, they kind of operate by, in, you input some, some x2 into it, right? This is, this is our f, basically. So I wish I had the mouse here. But OK, it, the data goes in from the left, and output comes in from the right. You can use that as a sort of abstraction. And, and neural networks kind of like, if you zoom in on them, they basically project information from left to right, like you can say. Um, they don't actually have a direction. We're just using that as a sort of like a picture, but, but you, you get the idea. And they tend to be much, much bigger, right? We looked at this a little bit last week, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep on moving. This is just a review. So for example, like if we were trying to do image classification of, of handwritten digits, right, that exists as nothing but pixels in a data set, which look like this, right? So pixels are, you know, this is all that we have, right? When you receive an image, it's just a whole bunch of pixel values. So what we can do is, if we want to recognize what digit that is, we would input those pixels as, as input neurons into a neural network, and then that neural network might be shaped like this, right? So all the pixels go in on the left, and then we have 10 output neurons that correspond to our classes, the digits on the right, and then what we hope is that when we go through all these these mathematical operations, you know, multiplications and additions and max operations, we uh, will get the highest amount of signal uh, in the correct neuron, right? So that's a six. So we hope the six neuron has the highest value, right? By the way, we call these values sometimes activations, right? So you'll hear me say this sometimes, activations. Uh, activations is the values inside the neurons. And, and you can think of that as distinct from the weights, which are the connections. Right? And uh, in the one layer neural network, this is, this is a very simple neural network because it just has one layer. And so we, that's, that's kind of the behavior that we hope to get. When you get a digit like a six, you get the highest amount of value on the six neuron. So if we train one of these, we feed it lots and lots of examples. And its accuracy at doing that goes up slowly. 86% um, accuracy is horrible for, for digit classification. The state of the art is 99.98 right now, so, so, but this is just a one-layer neural network. And, um, 
Oh yeah. One layer, uh, neural, uh, one layer is like that we count the number of layers with connections. So like there's, the, from the input to this is one layer, right? So this is our one layer. You'll see a two layer neural network in a couple of slides, right? Two, two layer neural network looks like this, right? So two layers, you go through two series of forward passes here. Um, so yeah, this is a two layer neural network, right? And when you have a two-layer neural network, you give the network the ability to, to kind of uh, learn features hierarchically, like learn, learn simple features in the first layer, and then learn more complicated features in the second layer. And this helps to break down the task a little bit. It turns out that our visual cortices work a little bit like this as well. So in, the, in, in our eyes, right, we have these retinas, which all they do is receive light they just have a whole bunch of photoreceptive sensors, you can think of them as, right? And then those neurons are simply absorbing light, and then they're forwarding to a, a set of neurons a little deeper in your, in your brain, basically, um, that are then combining those signals and learning to detect the presence of, of very simple patterns, like edges. So first your, your brain kind of sees edges, and then those are then combined further downstream into a set of neurons that combine those edges into, into let's say, corners or, or parallel lines or basically like very simple combinations of edges. And then those get sent to a set of neurons which combine those primitive shapes into somewhat more complicated shapes, you know, like simple polygons. And then those are further combined into more complicated shapes maybe even entire object categories, like doors, windows, right? Then doors and windows are combined to make cars and houses, right? Um, things, things like that. And it turns out that this, this greatly simplifies the processing that your, that your brain has to do, right? You can recognize an eye as an eye, whether or not it occurs in a human face or a dog face or, you know, other kinds of faces that have eyes. And that, that helps very much to lower the amount of, of um, like, different patterns that you have to memorize, right? You can you kind of form these hierarchical representations of objects in the world, and it helps you make sense of it using the least amount of mental energy as possible. Um, so we have very, very complicated visual, uh, visual systems, like humans are extremely visual compared to other mammals. Um, 20, something like, who knows this, like I think 25% of the brain is devoted to vision. I believe, and and 20 to 25 percent of human energy is expended on the brain. So basically, like something like five percent of of all of the energy that we consume is is for just for seeing. Um, I think that's more than even digestion, maybe. Right? I, that's that's actually I made that up. I don't know if that's true, <laughs> um, but but it, that's but it's, someone should someone should try to verify that. <laughs> anyway. Um, uh, but definitely the 25 and 20 percent, I didn't make up. I read that somewhere. Um, yeah. But if anyone wants to challenge that, then please, like, maybe I got the numbers mixed up. But it's something along those order, that order of magnitude. So in a more complicated data set, like, instead of numbers, you have things like cats, right? Um, then a lot of these one or two layer neural networks break down. They don't really form patterns effectively because the, because the data is too internally variant. There's too much complexity in cats. Uh, cats have different colors. They're facing different directions. They're, you know, sometimes they're curled up or outstretched. Images of cats have other things on them, in them as well. So that further complicates the task. And so we need to, complex, uh, to add some complexity to our neural networks. And that's accomplished via uh, what are called convolutional layers. And so convolutional neural networks are neural networks that have convolutional layers. It's not important for us to understand how convolution works. Like you can abstract away from this and just understand the x to f to y pipeline. Uh, but for those who are interested in understanding this, we did cover it in, in the neural aesthetic in lecture, I forget, I think lecture two, uh, how convolution works. So um, as I said, like not, super, not critical for this class, but if you're interested in learning how these work, and I highly encourage you to do so, um, I think lecture two, and also the book chapter three of ML4A has an explanation of how convolutional neural networks work 
In short, they're basically small scale pattern detectors that look for, look for patterns at a small scale in the image and then take those activations, like the amount of each pattern in, at every spatial location in the image and then combine them into a new representation and then do this multiple times to, to basically get your representation um, in this sense. We did, I showed you a quick demo last week that kind of showed this process. Um, you know, remember that we, we found the head neuron, right, the face neuron, sorry, um, that, uh, that was located at a particular spatial, lo spatial location inside of the image. So these, these are kind of things that help, the neuro help neural networks identify things um, in, in a way that's, that's basically efficient. Um, and, and like I said, like our brains actually like have some similarities. And by the way, this also, it's not just for vision, it works similarly for other kinds of things as well. So for sound as well, you can do uh, convolution on sound. Um, so audio, basically. So it, wor it works very, very similarly, which is really great. Um, one of the great things about deep learning is that um, it basically works across different kinds of media with very little, uh, effectively very little change. So instead of using pixels, we use audio samples if you want to do sound, and it works very similarly. Of course, audio samples are not in 2D. They're just kind of like a one-dimensional line, but then you just use 1D convolutions. Like, so that doesn't make sense to most people, but it, it will make sense to you if you, um, if you read the convolutional neural networks chapter. Okay, so let's start getting into the stuff that's going to be relevant for us, which is this you know, notion of interactive learning. The, um, when the neural network receives an image and does this classification, as we've seen in the previous slides, it does this by extracting patterns, simple patterns, then turning those simple patterns into more complicated patterns, then turning the more complicated patterns into even more complicated patterns, and then finally we get the most complicated pattern of all, which is the whole label assignment, right? So for, an, for a cat, that would be cat, right? Or for a dog, it would be dog, right? And that's, that's the most complicated pattern, right? It's the whole object category. And so, you, very often when you learn about neural networks, you learn about them in this context, that this is what they do. But, um, but the thing is that um, we don't want to simply understand them in terms of this sort of, um, you know, like, like this sort of black box way of thinking about it, because, uh, because really the, the most valuable aspect of it is the fact that you're learning an internal representation inside of that, inside of the learn, in, well, inside of the actual neural network, right? And so the goods, yeah, that's what I mean by it. the good stuff is actually in here because besides for just the label, we have this data, this sort of, this representation of the data, um, which is meaningful. It has, it has uh, it's located patterns, it's located um, both, both complex patterns and simple patterns, right? And so the really, really good stuff is actually right at the end, right there, right? So if you look at a neural network, let's say it has 20 layers, right? And so in the first layer, it's simple patterns. In the second layer, it's more complicated patterns. Third layer, more complicated, and so on. As you go through the, through the layers of the network, the representation becomes more and more, more and more rich, right? And then the very, very last layer before the labels is a, is a very, very high level of statistical representation of that image. And it turns out that that representation can be used for so many more things besides for just classification. And, om and, and almost all of the applications that, that I'll show you in just a few moments are examples of this. Right? So I just want um, to just look at this a little bit more, more concretely. Let's say uh, you have a trained neural network, right, which is on the left. Then you can take that last layer uh, that has this rich representation of the image and use it to train a totally different task that is interesting to you. So this is, this is called transfer learning, right? Because, okay, like, let's say we have this, let's say we have this model that can tell you if something is a cat or if something is a dog, right? And it has, you know, a hundred or a thousand categories. Well, that's great, but, like, how is that relevant to us, right? We don't necessarily care about identifying those particular hundred or thousand categories, what we want to do is we want to, we want to create interactive scenarios or maybe we want to identify different kinds of objects, right? Well, the idea is that using transfer learning, you can take 
a trained neural network, which is very, very, like, really, really well trained to identify a 1,000 categories, and you can repurpose it to, to uh, identify other kinds of categories. Or maybe not to identify other kinds of categories, but to do other kinds of, uh, to do other things altogether. Like maybe drive an interactive installation or something like that, according to, um, according to some, some criteria that you define. So that's, that's kind of the idea of transfer learning. And we're going we're gonna to look at that in just a few moments. Uh, but that, that's really basically like, that's the, the main idea. We're going to take trained neural networks and we're going to extract a feature vector from them. And the feature vector is exactly that thing that I alluded to, this last layer of activations, which contains a representation of the image, of uh, representation of the image corresponding to a bunch of information, well, how should we say it, like statistically meaningful or perceptually meaningful features. I guess that's the best way to put it, maybe. Um, okay, so, so that, that's really what we're going to be doing. So what I'm going to do is I'm now going to show you some of these ML4A demos in open frameworks. Uh, and we're gonna and, and you can feel free to follow along um, with the down I'll show you how to how to interact with those downloads. Um, and actually let's see what time it is. Let's see. Because I'd like for people to mostly follow along if we can. So it's 1250, so we'll take a break in like 20 minutes or so. So let's kind of start this. And what I'll do is did anyone does everyone have it now? Everyone has the ML frame, so we passed this uh, pass this demo around. I think you don't. Uh, sorry. Okay. So let me let me now. So basically, for, if you don't have it, grab the grab the zip file ml for a dash ofx dash aaa.zip from that hard disk, and then um, and then basically I'll show you how to how to follow along. Okay. So basically, now for those of you who are in my class last semester, uh, then. Then we, we did this in the first couple of weeks, so this will all be very, very familiar to you. Um, it's definitely still worth going through these anyway, just to get more practice with them. Uh, because we're going to, because for two reasons. This will, first of all, this will give you some tools that you can actually use in building things. But also because it will, it will sort of jog your, your memory a little bit and give you an idea of how these components can be, can be networked together. Right? Some, something like that. Um, and the tools that I'm going to show you specifically are all written in open frameworks, but you don't need to use open frameworks to use them because I'm just giving you standalone applications that work on Mac. Um, for those of you who are using open frameworks or are interested, you can modify these directly because they're all open source. They're all on the ML4A GitHub uh, page. Um, so if you're interested in that, please ask me about it. And, um, and also, these are very much uh, interchangeable with uh, Wekinator, for example, which can also be used uh, to do some of the same things. And also, actually, these two things can, can play together very nicely, and you'll see an example of that in just a moment. Um, and then I'll show you some ML5 stuff also. Probably we won't do the ML5 demos, but I'll show, you, show them to you. Because a few of the ML5 demos are basically the same thing, except in JavaScript. So for those of you who want to experiment a little bit more with, with JavaScript or web stuff, you'll see that these are very, very much cross-functional uh, or interchangeable with, with uh, the Open Frameworks demos. Um, okay, so what I'm going to do is, um, okay. so what I'm gonna do is I'm going to do basically a quick, I'm actually gonna go quick through these because the, the point isn't to do a tutorial because the tutorials are actually recorded on neural aesthetics. So like I have longer demos that are recorded. We're recording this as well. So I will go from scratch, but I'll just do it fast. So um, so the, the reason is to just save a little bit of time so everyone sees what all the things do. And also because we're recording this, if you want to back up and try something again, it's all recorded, right? So for that reason, you don't, you don't feel, you don't need to actually follow along with me right now if you don't want to, um, but you certainly are welcome to. Um, in, in any case, I will try to I, I want to be comprehensive and show all of them to you, so they, they may all be like relatively quick. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, I think that's so. Basically, you should have this right, this ML for a ofx dot zip, and um, so just unzip it. Okay, and you should receive this. 
This, by the way, also can be downloaded from, uh, from GitHub. So if you go to the ML for a page and then you go to code, and then you'll see this ML for dash OFX. And so that's here. And then basically, if you click on releases, you'll see that this, this is the thing that we're looking at. You can download this. And then there's one other thing that you'll have to do, which is there's a, there's a file inside called setup.sh. Um, you, don't, you don't actually need to use it right now because I already did it. But basically, inside you'll see there's a file called setup.sh. And setup.sh, you, you would run from the terminal. There's instructions on the release page how to run it. And that downloads a bunch of data files for you. We don't need to do this right now because it's already included. Okay? Now, one other thing that you'll need to do, um, if you, like, let's see if this actually happens for me. So let, let's say, like, I'm going to start with Covenant Predictor. If you double click on it, uh, first of all, it'll go unidentified. Oh, it does open. Okay. You might see, it might, uh, you, you might get a problem that says um, no network file found, right? So a bunch of you probably see when you open this, it says no network file found. The reason for that is really is a stupid Mac thing. So since the last couple of, um, uh, well, it's not stupid. I guess it's good, like security, but basically like when you get a new app, for security reasons, it puts it in a, in like a random temporary folder internally, and so then it can't find the data files. There's a really simple way to fix this, which is that if you see this no network file found, just simply take the application, move it into the data folder, and then move it back. It's really really silly, but then once you do that, then it um, then it like then it knows. Um, this, it's a feature called translocation. I don't know why it's called that, but basically. Um, it's a security feature in Mac, so if you get this no network file found, just try moving the file and then moving it back. Uh, not undoing, but actually moving it back. So that, that makes it work. For those of you who are trying, you should, you should see something like this, right? Camera opens up, um, <clears throat> and you should get something like this, right? Um, does anyone have any weird problems? I'm just, I'm just trying to get a sense if, if this doesn't work. It looks like most people it actually works for them. So, okay, what, what is this? This is an application in ML for a of, uh, in Open Frameworks that will let you train a neural network to uh, recognize different categories of objects, um, whatever it is that you want to do. And then the application itself doesn't do anything interesting other than that, you know, identifying objects. Uh, but then it actually sends the um, it actually sends those results to uh, over OSC, so you can receive them in processing, in open frameworks, in, in Max MSP, in Touch Designer, in, I don't know, what else are people using? Anything that receives OSC. And, and you could also make it work with P5 as well. Um, obviously, OSC doesn't really, doesn't natively work for web stuff, but you can, you can go over a web socket to P5. I have a GitHub repository that shows you how to do OSC stuff with P5. Um, but basically, like, you can, you, well, of course, also, you don't really need to do this in P5 anymore because we have ML5, so that's necessary, but, but just so you know about it. So let me show you how to do this. In the beginning, you'll see nothing, right? And, um, and so I'll go, okay, what is it that I want to learn? Let's say I want to learn a categorical variable. So there's two options to create outputs. I want to learn a categorical variable with, let's say, three classes. <clears throat> okay, so three classes. And then you get this slider. This, so basically, when you move the slider, it goes. So it goes zero, or sorry, one, two, and three. So this selects which category we're on, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to record a bunch of images, which associate, which will then become associated with class one. So I leave the slider at one, and then what I'll do is let's say I want I want one to be associated with my phone, right? So I'm going to put my phone in front of the camera, and I'm going to click record, and now it will be begin to record samples. I'll kind of move the phone around a little bit. So we get a bunch of samples, like maybe 50 or so, and try to move the phone around so it gets a nice diversity of samples, like because you want to be able to recognize the phone in different positions, right? So I'll stop recording, 
Then I'll change the slider to two. And let's say now I wanted to recognize the remote control. Okay, so now I'll do the, uh, so now I'll record this. Remote control. Right. I believe I did this with Ableton last week, right? I showed this a little bit, but I, is that correct? I don't remember if I did that or not. No, did I not do that? Did I do the Ableton example, anybody? Last okay, week last week. I don't think so, okay, so, okay, good. Then I'll show it to you now. Okay, and then, and then category three, I will now also record, and that's just gonna be me. So I'll just put myself in front of the camera. Hello, yeah, yeah. No remote, no phone. No, nothing, just, just me. Okay, so now I will stop recording. We got 210 samples, something like that is fine. And then I'll, I will hit, so just, just to get some of the other options here, you can clear the training data if you wanna start over. Um, and then first you'll hit, and then once you're ready, you hit train, and then it will be in flashing random colors for no reason, uh, just to let you know that it's thinking. And now it's trained. So now it's trained, and once it's trained, you can check mark predict, and now it's going to, oops, and now it's doing this, the prediction I'm telling you. So that's predicting class three, right? That's correct. Class two, one, three, right? So you can see it's pretty, it's pretty accurate in a small amount of data. All of this was done through the magic of transfer learning because in normal circumstances, 200 samples is not at all enough to train the neural network uh, on like an image recognizing neural network from scratch. But what we do is internally, there's actually a uh, trained neural network that's been trained on millions of images to recognize 1,000 different categories. And we are using this transfer learning process to re repurpose it for recognizing these three classes that are important to us, um, or, or you know, important to the application or whatever. Which network is? Uh, it, it's um, it's it, it, it's it's uh, it's actually one after the GGH, ZFNet, uh, 2014. ImageNet winning. It's already a little out of date, but it's fine for what we do. So um, so it's from 2014. It was the ImageNet winner, or actually, I think technically it's a replica of it, because the actual ImageNet winner in 2014 wasn't open sourced, I don't think, except for the architecture, and so this is retrained on it. Uh, but it's very accurate, it's very good. Um, one, so okay, so what can we do with this? Well, one thing we can do is we can get it into processing. Uh, oh, we can get it into MaxMSP. Who, who knows how to receive uh, in MaxMSP? It's UDP receive, right? UDP receive. I haven't used Max in like a really long time, but uh, it's like, UDP receive, and it receives on 12,000 uh, message. I can't believe I remember how to do this. Oh, look at that. It's totally working. Yeah. So look, look at that. In, so. See? So it's getting two. So you can, how does this work now? It's like split, split. String. Oh my God! If I do, if I remember how to do this, I'm so proud. Is it split? I used to use Max like a lot, a really long time ago. Is that no? It's not working. Who knows how to do this properly? Does anybody use Max here? Yeah, I'm not. Well, anyway, like you would split the message, and the string would go on through, through one, and then. Um, or maybe it's like, um, what was that? No, 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 I'm just trying to split the message so, so I get the integer. Anyway, it doesn't matter because no one, I guess no one really uses Max here. But anyway, so you get into Max, you get into processing, right? So we can open up processing and this is, I'll, I have a, I'll share the example, but basically it's really, it's super easy to do this in processing as well. When you have the, P, uh, when you have the OSC library, right, uh, OSC P5, I would go to message, and I basically just copy uh, from message. Let's just make this a little bigger. Uh, 
Okay. So I'm just going to copy this actually, and then I'm going to remove a bunch of stuff from it that we don't need. Right. So basically, we would receive OSC on port. It's it's sending on port twelve thousand, and it's sending with the message slash wex slash outputs. So twelve thousand slash wex slash outputs. The reason why it's slash wex slash outputs is that it's designed to work perfectly with Wekinator, um, which which maybe I'll also show you in a moment. Uh, but basically, okay, receive on port twelve thousand, and we we're not sending, so we can get rid of this my remote load, my remote. Right, so I'm just getting rid of a bunch of stuff. Don't need this. Don't need this. And now what we'll do is we'll receive this message, and we'll say, okay, if the message check address pattern, I think it is, and then it's slash wex slash outputs. Then, so if it receives the message slash wex slash outputs, then grab then what we'll do is we'll, we'll create a variable called x and we'll say x equals message.get0 float value. I think this should work. And so then we can say uh, if, if x equals uh, 1.0, we'll make the background red. If it is equal to 2.0, make it green. And if it is, uh, and otherwise, just make it blue. Okay, let's see if this works properly. It should work. Right, blue, red, green. Right, so, okay, what's this good for? Well, it's good for that you can maybe trigger certain kinds of actions when, when something happens to go in front of the camera. Right, so this is, this is the basis for, for like 90% of interactive uh, machine learning projects. It's usually responding to some camera stimulus, right? Um, and another thing you can do is instead of doing this, we can, I'm going to stop this, I'm going to remove this slider. Oh, there's no way to remove it. Actually. <laughs> um, so I'll just, I'll just restart this. I'm going to go back to, for some reason it always crashes when you exit, which isn't a big deal, but anyway. Um, now I'm going to do a, now, now I'll show you how to do a slider. So instead of a categorical variable, we'll have a slider. Okay. So let's do, let's do this really simply. I'll just say, if if it's just me, then record a bunch of examples. And then how about this? What we'll do is we'll try to make, we'll associate the phone with slider at one, but actually what we'll do is we'll try to make it like correspond to how, to how big it is. So like I'll try to kind of do this, right? So that, that'll be good. So now we'll say, yeah, something like that. And I'll record and around here, so that's pretty good. And then as I grow it, so basically like the bigger the phone, the bigger Y becomes. This is a little silly, but, and now I'll stop recording. So now let's hit train, and that's train, and so now, we can set it to be predicting. Well, it's not, it's not amazingly reactive, but, but it's decent. Also, this prediction lurk right here smooths the signal. So if this, were, if this was all the way low, then it would be kind of, it would be very smooth, but slow to react. Whereas if prediction lurk was all the way up, then it's very jumpy, but, but it's very fast. Uh, is fast in the sense that it um, goes directly to the value that it's predicting. This the the prediction lerp kind of slows it down a little bit. So you so if you don't want the thing to be very jumpy, then it's kind of a useful thing to have. I'm going to set the prediction lerp like somewhere down here. That's pretty decent. And now what we can do is 
this is now receiving this value and instead of now it's going to be anywhere between 0 and 1 so we can just do something like x times 255 right so basically right so that's the basic idea yeah how much of this from our training to left hand how much of this Uh, I mean, it's influenced, but the but the idea is that the neural, neural networks are they're kind of smart. They try to they try to find the thing, the pattern that you're because the face and the hands are in all of the images, right? So it kind of normalizes for that a little bit. Yeah, it looks for features that are important, um, which is the features that distinguish uh, what's going on. You can see it's not amazingly accurate, but but it's good enough to detect you know different kinds of objects pretty well. So so you can definitely. Uh, was there another question back there? No? Ah, okay. So, so that's the basic idea with CovNet Predictor and, and getting it into processing. Let me show you a few of the other things. Let's see, it's just 120 and we started at 1210. Um, let's just think. I, so I'm just thinking a lot. I want to show you, I want to show you the Ableton thing. So yeah, I'm going to show you the Ableton thing, but I have to switch computers for that because I don't have Ableton in this computer. Or actually, do I? Maybe I do have it. Oh yeah, we do. Okay. So let me show you one fun one fun thing you can do with with. Um, did I, I really didn't do this last week? For some reason I thought I must have. But okay. Anybody here make music? Yeah. And uh, anybody here use Ableton Live? Yes. Okay, good. Well, I don't. So if you make good music, then you you can do way better than me. So here's Ableton Live. Ableton Live is amazingly easy to, to, to like get started with. Like I never use it, but I mean I just did one thing with it, which is show this demo. So let's make some drum and bass music, huh? Like where's my audio? Uh what do I have to do? Sorry? Built in Audio output device. Ah, yes, the HDMI. No, there should be one oh. the, uh, Yeah, that's probably not. Oh, really? If you just click on it. Okay, yeah. Oh, maybe maybe it's just that the volume is down. Mm. Where are the speakers? Uh, how does this here? But I don't know if there's a remote. Uh, there's just this. This no. is. No, that's the, that's yeah. Oh. Yeah, it is. Oh, well, the speakers are just off, right? So let's let's yeah, actually. Because just... it doesn't do anything. Like yeah, right. So I think. Yeah, I think the speakers are off. Oh, oh, I, I think it's just coming. Oh. Is that the speakers? Yeah, yeah, the speakers. No. Yeah, yeah. Oh, great. All right. Okay. Okay. So from now on, this class is all about making music. Uh, we're gonna be. This is a DJing seminar. So, okay, so let's do something. Um, I'm gonna turn tone this down a little bit. Okay, let's put in some EDM. I'm just making music randomly. No, oh, that's ugly. Okay. Oh, that's great, right? Beautiful. And also, I always have the jazz brushes. Guys, I need your attention. This is very serious. Very serious. This is, um, and one more thing I'm going to do is the tabla. Okay. All right. Great. So now let's do this. I'm going to put a uh, an effect on these. Let's go to the saturator warm up lows no it doesn't work um, because it doesn't do anything whoa okay all right i'll just go with the resonator cuz i know that works okay now what i'm going to do 
is I'm going to open up an application called Ableton OSC. Ableton OSC lets me control all of the, uh, it's an intermediate, uh, intermediary application that lets me control Ableton sliders. So Ableton by itself doesn't really, uh, is a little bit of a closed sandbox of sorts, unless you use Max for Live or something like that. Um, this is actually probably better done through Max for Live, but I'll just show you the way to uh, The point is that we, we're going to control some of these, some of these like elements from the camera. So here's the idea. So like I'm going to grab the master track, and here's Los, the Los Angeles. It says Los Angeles because I put in this Los Angeles filter. It found it. Okay. Um, it this only updates like uh, it doesn't update as you add stuff to it. So you kind of just open it once you're done with your set. And so I'll say like, okay, let's pick a dry wet. You see it controlling the slider over here. It just kind of goes like. Okay, so that's kind of nice, right? And um, let's grab the tempo. Okay, 900 beats per minute. A little fast. So now I have that in there. And finally, I can grab. Let's now reopen Covenant Predictor. And Covenant Predictor is made to automatically send to Ableton OSC. So we have these two sliders over here. So I'm going to make two sliders here. So now these control those. It's a little annoying that it's just two step hop. Uh, the reason for that is because um, it, it is to make it so that this interacts with this automatically and it's a little, I mean I could merge them but it's, you know, um, that's just too much work. So, so we have this and now let's kind of like, let's do something like We'll make the music like this, and I'll put my phone in front of it, and we'll record a bunch of samples again. Now we have two sliders. Okay, stop. Now let's turn, make it dry, and fast. And this will be the remote. I, I literally use the same objects like every time. It's just the same thing that's lying around. Okay, cool. And now, my favorite thing to do is to turn the tempo down really low. That's great, All right? Zero tempo. Okay, now record again, and just me. And now let's let's do one more experimental feature. Um, no, never mind. Okay. Um, so let's go train, and then predict. Yes, thank you. <laughs> okay, so so that's something cool that you can do, right? Now another thing that you can do is if you use for those of you musicians, I also have a very similar thing here called Audio Unit OSC, which is which has some bugs, but but may be worth looking into if you use audio units. So for example, I use this audio unit called um, oh, but I don't have it here actually. Well. Yeah, this, it, it'll just grab all your audio units that are installed, like Apple has a bunch of default ones, and then, and then there's probably nothing here that we can really use, actually. But anyway, if you have any audio units installed, for those of you musicians, like, they should show up here, and then you could try to control those parameters as well. So that's, that's also worth investigating. Um, okay, so that's 125. Let me just see if there's one thing I want to show. 
All right, let's just take a quick break, and then I'll come back and I'll show you a few more—not all of these, but a few more of them—and then and then we'll then we'll talk about why. Um, so let's make the break not super long, like these breaks keep stretching for like eight, nine, fifteen minutes. Like let's be back here at one thirty-two. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. We started the class late though, so that counts as a break. Yeah, I wanna I wanna refrain from this like gradual erosion of the class boundaries. Yeah, yeah, very, very, very strict, yeah. No talking, no smiling. I saw Jesse smile. Yeah, you were okay. I said behind you, I said behind you. I've been watching you. It was very serious. Totally unacceptable. Smiling. That's a new rule. No more smiling. No fun. No fun. Very fun. Oh, yeah, good, good. Did you go to the session? No, because the problem was that it was, it was like literally, the, it was at 7 p.m. Yeah. We're still way out of that. Yeah. And also, another reason is because I, took, I like lost my yoga bag in between trails and then transit over there. So I got a new yoga bag. Oh, you mean like a transit trip to New York? Yeah. Oh, okay. I just took it here, but then I lost it. So then I got a new one. So it's, the next one is again, <laughs> <laughs> it's always Friday, so I'm kind of on this point. So then I'll be very pretty to do it. But I think we can do it. This Friday and the Friday after the four classes. It's not every Friday. It's only on the first Friday. So the first one, the next one is March 1st. They have some amazing videos. Yeah, they have to do that. They're integrating a lot of machines. Yeah, it's like a Friday night. It's actually a good class. It's Catherine is teaching us the designing meaningful dash. Catherine? Dylan? Uh, it's interesting because she has this kind of like design perspective on some things, which is good for things. You know, not just like an artist who cares about the user or whatever on the audience, but more like, okay, do you want to make something that actually other people can identify with or not? It's an interesting, it's an interesting uh, thought process for me because I'm usually like, I don't care. It's my thing. I saw that Daniel. It is having a show tomorrow. Daniel. Yeah, Daniel Rose. Rose. Yeah. yeah. I want to see it because he worked with uh, paper clay. You know, this kind of like the clay that you do not burn that dries uh, in here. So he had to do his, you know, he does the stuff, but he does this kind of like he cut it out by hand. All of the, uh, the things that he had to bend it by hand so they look like, you know, this earth, this dried up earth. Uh -huh. Where is it? Is it? Uh, it says Bitcoin. Yeah, yeah, I think we're going to drop my tomorrow after, after yeah. Yeah, there's so much, so much happening at the moment. It's like, ah, uh, yeah, we got now, um, it's an interesting project. We, we got a whole lot of 130 TVs working in the division. Was well, like 80 and extra 100, no, 80 and 50. Yeah. Mm -hmm. TV is like, like uh, what 30, 32 by 24. CRT. Um, what is CRT? Like the, they're from 2008. Like, uh, it's got 130 and then yeah. at ICD? No, it's like a friend of mine. It's 130? Uh, Wait, I, I want. <laughs> I, I, I want to do something with this. Well, so here's the thing, you're five people, Brent is part of it, um, Anthony and Asha, I don't know, Anthony and Asha, but Anthony, you know Anthony from your class. Which one? Anthony. Uh, oh, oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Anthony, Brandon, Brandon. Um, so we're, and Kimberly, uh, I think he's on your class. So we just, we got on Monday, we got maybe. Like, like a quarter million dollars, like it's no because like the, the market value of like, my like, is it's pretty much not. We have to like hold like two thousand. So what do you do? First of all, you have to set up some way to track them, right? So yeah. So the thing is, is like a what's the big idea? B, how do we get the money for it? the big idea? Because like this is a huge problem. Because like you know you need to address them individually, yeah. ideally. Yeah. Um, 
about, but yeah, we're not quite sure. We thought about maybe messing them with you know, the idea of an orchestra. Um, so it's like a symphonic or something. It's got like a hundred kiddies as musicians just on chairs. And then you do something in the back of our Oh, that's, that's wild. That would be fun. But the thing is, then they're hard to see the two screens. Mm -hmm. well, the screens are hard to see. Yeah, oh, they make sounds. They make sounds. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah, we didn't talk to her, but we thought about not just having it as a sculpture. We don't want to do a matrix. We don't want to do like the boring. I mean, not boring, but you know, yeah, like, like have, it, have it be that you walk inside of a horseshoe or something. More like yeah, more like a sculptural piece or like this. Oh. But yeah, no, we're no, very no, excited. Dome would be great. No. But like, I mean, Anthony and Nasha, they're burners, so it's all burning in their lungs. So yeah. I think that it's totally yeah. how it's kind of like. Um, but yeah, the thing is, is like we, it's super exciting. We're not sure if we can use this machine. Yeah, yeah. It's an interesting project. We're, we're not sure, because like, you need a lot of money for it. Yeah. Especially the no thing. It's so expensive. Yeah. Because we have like, so we want to do it with a hundred. We do not do small. We get, like, it's one project. This is like the, this is the, there's no smaller thing. Because you can either do it or not. It's like, but yeah, it's super exciting. It's like, wow. It's, we don't know what to, we, we kind of like, we meet next week and we have like rough ideas that we bounce around. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's exciting. Okay, I'm in. Yeah, it's like, it's I'm a project. It's interesting, right? <laughs> it's like there is a, we're, we're kind of not sure what we, we should do with it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, this is this is pretty. It's pretty massive. Yeah, I definitely. I definitely want to think about it. I mean, obviously, like generative models. Like, I just think there is a lot of potential with machine learning involved. Well, yes. Always. And the thing is, like, if you think of kind of like the, I mean, as I said, it's a money question because, like, if you want something interactive with the screen, you want a camera on each. You know, it's, like, it's getting. Like, even if you just address them with a Raspberry Pi, yeah, it's like per per unit, probably like just the electronics is fifty bucks or sixty. Fantastic. Yeah. No, I mean, uh, you could you could manage multiple computers, uh, multiple screens from one computer. I mean, you know, it's just super expensive. The the the, the cables, at least they're like if you if you like the splicers. It's like ten thousand, uh, just for slicing. Yeah. Like, so, so this. But what's yeah. interesting? So Danny, Dano did a. So he went with people's found it. It was actually they had a cable. They had two cable channels and a cable network. So what they did was interactive TV via analog broadcast. So we came with those TVs that we had. I'm not sure about the technical stuff, but Anthony told me that we can do analog broadcasting. We probably cannot address it individually, I think. I don't know who's to play with different channels. Maybe. So we're going to talk again, because he did, I don't know if you have seen this stuff, but he did in the 90s. Like our demo. No. We should have a look. It was rad. They did interactive TV shows in the 90s. Telephone, and you could bring in and kind of like uh, address cameras that should be showing. It's like really the early stages of interactivity yeah. with a phone. It was the stuff is like Sean has all the videos, he showed them in one class. Like Mary and Pete and Benno, and as students and as residents, yeah. they did sick stuff. Yeah, yeah. So cool. Because that might, like, ideally, if you think of like, so you could get a hundred channels. Uh, that would be, it. you know, you just broadcast stuff. Um, I don't know. It's like it's. We're not sure. I mean, it's like it's cool. Um, but as I said, it's like at the moment we just what we said is like we we leave them, we have them, we leave them, something maybe if we have. If we have them, we want to talk to them as people. Yeah, yeah. Because at the moment, it's just the four or five of us. You know, mm -hmm. just to kind of like keep it small. Uh, but once we have all of them in our hands and we have time, we want to kind of like reach out. And yeah. Get some. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think we should start. Obviously, like, where the hell is everybody? Um, I think so. <laughs> it's great.
<laughs> oh, yeah. everyone really takes me seriously. 130, 132 to Blizzard. 136. It's actually pretty good for, for my team class to get people in after five minutes break. Like a, uh, pretty good. Usually, I, I was thinking about it. Maybe we should just not have breaks. Uh, yes. This is just for me. I, um, um, I just like, I didn't make this for me. <laughs> but I, uh, there's like yeah. a 3D fractal yeah, software called Mandelbolt, where you can sort of, like, you can generate these fractals. But yeah. you can also just zoom around. Just get it. Generate. Okay, most people are here, so we'll let we'll let everyone else like kind of trickle in. I wanna yes, I wanna show people that I actually want to whittle away this this fifteen minute over this I don't know overfed break. So okay, um, I want to show you guys some more stuff that we can use with with these interactive elements, and then we'll kind of move on. Let me just see how we're doing with with material. Okay, not 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 too bad. We might actually end up doing more of the stuff that I. Okay, well anyway, um, I'm just gonna kind of go through them. So we just looked at Ableton, audio classifier. This one's really cool. Um, audio classifier will let you classify different sounds. Um, and and I'll actually, you know what? I'm gonna save this for for when everyone's here because that one's that one I want everyone to see. Uh, I want to, let's see, so the Cov so Covenant OSC is the same as Covenant Predictor, except that, it, that it, simp it doesn't actually do any of the machine learning itself. It just sends the, uh, the activations, like feature vectors, over OSC. So you can actually make it work with Wekinator this way. So if you, if for, uh, for those of you who may want to use Wekinator for something, this is not the most amazing way to, or not the most ideal way to interact with Wekinator, but for example, like send 4,096 values to Wekinator, and then basically now when I start sending, it's sending, you see it's receiving, oh, and then start recording, and it's now it's now Wekinator is receiving from Covenant OSC. So that's another thing you can do. Yes. Okay, another thing I want to show you is audio TSNE and image TSNE. So these are uh, image TSNE live is um, is basically so image TSNE viewer and image TSNE live are both going to show you something called TSNE. TSNE is a technique for visualizing high dimensional data in two or three dimensions. It's a way of of grouping um, da like uh, interesting things like images in such a way that similar images are grouped near each other. So let's actually do this demo. I have a folder of images somewhere. So image CSNE looks like this, image CSNE live. And what we can do is you basically go, okay, analyze new directory and you find a, a folder of images. And I, I should have one in my documents here. Uh, hang on a second. So Gene and then Data sets, animals. So let me let me quickly show you. This is a folder. Let me let me first select it and then start analyzing. Basically, there's a there's a folder of images. I'll show you them in a second. And when you click open from the folder, it will. Oh, actually, I want to stop this. Actually, I don't want to do one more than 500. So I'll make the max number of images, not 500, but we'll make it bigger. Let's let's say like this many and then click Analyze New Directory, and now click this. So while it's analyzing, it's, it's gonna load this many images from that folder, almost 2,000 of them, um, and it, the folder looks like this. Um, documents, where is it? Gene. Data sets, and then it's just a bunch of images of animals, so Okay, so there's a picture of me earlier today. Um, so bats, bears, bonsai trees, cactuses, centipedes, basically a bunch of animals, um, dogs, right? So what it's doing, this application, what it's doing is it loaded all the images. Now it is doing, now the step is encoding 
Encoding means that it's, that it's um, running them through the neural network and extracting a feature vector from them, right? So it's encoding the image as a feature vector, a 4096 dimensional feature vector that describes the image statistically, sort of its features, its patterns. And um, so it's actually doing so far the same thing that we looked at in CubNet Predictor. CubNet Predictor does the same thing. It just does it to the webcam. It extracts the feature vector. Yep. Um, how do you, like, show the Yeah, absolutely, yeah. So this is all made in open frameworks. So for those of you who are familiar with open frameworks, it's, a, it's like a programming environment, that, like creative coding toolkit. Basically in C++, it's very similar to processing, except it's in C++. And um, if you want to look at the code, so okay, so you can go to mlfray to github.io, click on code, and click on mlfray OFX, and the code is all in here. These are all open frameworks modules, so you have to know how to use open frameworks first in order to be able to use these, oh, um, which you can do by going to openframeworks.cc. Open frameworks is in... Um, is like a, like I said, it's a creative coding toolkit. There's a really strong community behind it that I'm a, me a member of. A lot of people here at, at ICP are very much like using, using Open Frameworks or affiliated with it, and uh, you can download it here and so on. So basically, once you're using that, you can, you can easily modify these examples to suit your needs. Um, and the code is all in here, like the apps, and here's image TCD Live, and here's the code. Yeah. So here's the app. That, does that answer your question? Yeah, this is in Python. No, it's in C plus plus. Yeah. Okay, so now, um, okay, so that's that's while that's analyzing, let me show you another one. I'll show you image uh, audio TSNI. Uh, let's see if it's actually working. Audio. Ah, we have to do. Okay, I'm not gonna do the audio TSNI live just because I don't I don't I don't want to take the time to do the analysis, but audio TSNI live will analyze either a directory of audio clips or a single song. And then actually, I think maybe I have, um, I thought I had maybe, no. Uh, maybe, ah, you know what? Uh, I know where I can find it. I think it's like, uh, oh, right. um, <laughs> audio, geez. do I have, I might not have it linked, it's like, in the archive, um, maybe I don't have it actually, no, no, not that. It's like works audio TC. Or is it audio? <laughs> okay, maybe I won't be able to find it. Okay, fine. Um, well, I'll have to show it to you later, but basically it's the, it's the audio equivalent of this thing, which is okay, now about halfway done. So we'll come back to this when it's done analyzing, and I'll show it to you. In the meantime, I want to now also show you. Okay, so the Covenant ones, they're all the same. Face predictor. Face predictor is the same thing as Covenant predictor, except, as you might have guessed, um, it uses face tracking. So the feature vector is basically the points of the face. So okay, like, I, what can we do with this? I can make it recognize different facial expressions. So like, let's say we'll have three facial expressions that I want to analyze. And we'll say, okay, zero is neutral. Move around it. Neutral. Um, then uh, class two will be happy. Class three will be, someone give me an emotion. Sad. All right. Okay. <laughs> I can't do it. It's also probably not going to work very well, but all right, let's try it. I'll just try to frown. Okay, so it's the same, basically same interface, so train, and we can go, oh, it's working horrible, oh, predict, of course, okay.
See, there's a sa there's sadness and neutral is confused, right? Um, which is exactly <laughs> it's really it really makes sense, doesn't it? Um, <laughs> so, but okay, well, you get the idea. So, like, uh, maybe we could do a surprised cat. You know, like, well, you get the, you get the idea. So you can tie this to facial expressions. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> that's excellent. So, so yeah, that that's another thing you can do. So that's. Face and, and then the other one's really like um, face predictor really kind of just does all the face ones combined. Um, so and the same thing for cubnet. So they're all kind of um, superfluous a little bit. And then also so we're looking at image CSNE live keyboard OSC. I'll show you next. Um, there's a few uh, of these OSC things. So for those of you who are using the connect, I don't have a connect here, but if you open this and put the connect in front of it, it'll grab, it'll find the skeleton and it'll send it over OSC. So you can you can use this as a nice little sort of like, it, it's a really straightforward application. It'll grab skeleton points and then make those uh, points that you can send to Weaponator or you can send to, um, it doesn't do any machine learning within that, so it normally works nicely with Weaponator. Uh, but but this works with connect. If anyone wants to end up using it you, and don't know how, you can you can definitely talk to me. Like a, a bunch of people here have experienced with it already. Um, then same thing for leap motion for anyone who's using that. Does anyone use leap motion anymore? It's kind of a little yeah. Okay, so a few people. Leap motion has leap been doing anything in the last like year or two? Are they updating? Like, yeah, yeah. More into uh, VR. Yeah. Leap, the leap is doing VR. No, no, the HTC. Wait, but leap motion itself. Yeah, they're trying to add. No, but you can make. Oh. Uh huh. Okay, I haven't really been up to date with leap for a little while. So, but with the original, if they're still updating that, it's like the little device that does the hand tracking. Um, so it works. Okay. So you can use leap motion OSC. Um, reverse image search you can kind of ignore. It's probably not not useful for us. So let's look at image CSNE. It should be done analyzing by now. Oh, look at that, right at the end. Now it's running TSNE on the encodings. So what that means, what that means is that it's basically taking these 2,000 images. So we have this matrix, this 2,000 by 4,000 matrix, uh, 4,096. Every one of the images has 4,096 numbers associated with it. It's a feature vector, right? So two images which have similar feature vectors will have will have similar feature vectors, right, in 4096D. So TSNE is what's called a dimensionality reduction algorithm. It takes those 4096 dimensions and it compresses them into two dimensions. Or It doesn't have to be two, but in this case it's two. It can be two or three or whatever you choose. And it does so in a way that tries to preserve the relationships between them. So like if two 4096 bit vectors are close to each other in feature space, then it'll get you two dimensional coordinates which are also close to each other. So, and but then the, the brilliant thing about having two dimensions is that you can visualize it in on the screen, right? You can use those as your coordinates um, for visualizing them. So it'll look like there's nothing there, but actually they're just hidden. Uh, you can you can see that they're they've now been organized in TSNE. and and what you can do is you can you can uh, you can scroll. Isn't that nice? Ooh. Um, you can scroll and you can zoom, and you can also turn the image size bigger if you want to scale them. Right? And so you see that similar images have been grouped together. So a bear eating some trash is similar to uh, tricerat or triceratops. That's triceratops. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> uh, some dogs here. Uh, so here's a cluster of bears near some raccoons. Here's the raccoon cluster. Um, we can kind of zoom. So another n n neat thing that you could do with this is if you check mark view as grid, it'll turn them into a grid. So this is very nice and organized. So here's a bunch of bugs, some starfish, some zebras, um, some, some flowers, right? So you get the idea. You can do this to a folder of images, right? So you can take all of the images in your computer even. And like if you ever wanted to do a, a deep dive into your images and, you know, group all your vacation photos with your photos of your dog and all of that, uh, image TSNE is a nice little way to do it. Um, yeah? Okay. But if you 
do it on the edges on the computer. Uh, it's training locally, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. No, no, no. It's not sending them all to me. That's what I want you to think. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's all, it's all being done locally, um, as far as I know. So, um, the, uh, yeah, it's just using doing a local analysis and everything, um, and then, and then, yeah, making one of these. Oh, this is great. The unicorn cluster. There's some unicorns. Unicorns and giraffes. I have one that's a, like a mega one of the entire Cal 256 data set, which has 10,000 images. I think it's 10,000 images. And so there's this mega cluster of unicorns, Superman, Jesus, and Buddha. <laughs> and Buddha, yeah. So, yeah. High level features indeed. Right? So, anyway, um, so that's pretty nice. You can use this. And, I've, and like I said, the audio Tisney is uh, similar except it's just for audio samples. So you get groups of similar sounding things. I've had students use that for projects where they make like an automatic DJ that kind of goes around the, the audio TCD space and plays music, like granular synthesis kind of thing. So that's that's one category of things that you can make. Yeah? What does this actually use to be encoded? Oh, uh, like the, the feature vector from a CubNet. Okay. You, you are from a neural network. So you forward all of these images through the neural network and you extract each of their last layer activations. Okay. Yeah. And then that's their feature vector, and then you can do TCD on any feature vector, right? So it doesn't have to be image features, it could be could be whatever, right? Um, so let me move on. Now I will show you audio. Um, uh, let's look at audio classifier. So this is great. Audio classifier will let us um, classify sounds, right? So let me show you how to use this, and we're going to interact. We're going to actually do something really funny. Um, okay, here's what I want to do. I want to. We're going to do this. We're going to do this all together. Um, okay, let, I hope this works. So let's try. So basically, this will analyze sounds uh, using a feature vector called uh, using features made up of what's called MFCCs. MFCCs are called Mel frequency uh, or Mel frequency capstroke coefficients. Does anyone know what th those are? Oh uh, yeah. <laughs> I used to do like music, uh, music information retrieval, and music technology, so I know more about these than anyone should. But basically, these are like perceptually meaningful audio features. They're very closely related to like an FFT, like analysis of audio and the frequency level. And so, you any sound has a these M MFCC bands, and it turns out that they're actually like a nice representation of audio. So, for example, um, let's do the following. Let's all clap. Uh, in a second. So what I want you to do is, when I do this, you will clap. And we're going to record those and associate them as class one. Okay, so ready? Good, good. So we got 24, that's fine. Um, now, they only start recording after we go above the this volume threshold. So it records as a, a basically like the first, I don't know what it is, I think a second after it hits that volume threshold. And um, and so we recorded 24 samples because it does, I think, more, or what is it? I, f I think maybe a tenth of a second. I forget exactly how it works, but something like along that. We got 24 samples of audio of uh, clapping and associated that with class one. Now I'm going to turn off the, th the threshold. So we're going to not have threshold mode so that red button goes away and it'll record as soon as I start hitting record. We don't have to hit a threshold. So here's what I want to do. This is gonna this is gonna be very silly, but bear with me. This is all for a good cause. It's all for a very good cause. So I want everyone to on the count of three we're all gonna big let out a big great big long ooh. Okay? okay. Alright here we go. So as soon as I hit record or actually, like on the count of three, we'll start ooing, and then I'll hit record, and it'll, we'll rec and then hold that oo for at least five seconds. Okay, so a big long oo. Okay, <laughs> that's I mean, all right, three three to five seconds. Oh my god. Okay, ready? Okay. Well, on the count of three, on the count of three. <laughs> okay, one, two, three. Same thing, except, ah. Okay, ready? One, two, three. Ah. Great, 
Great, great. And actually, let's go back and get a few more claps because I think maybe we didn't get quite enough samples of those. Um, uh, where's the volume? Oh, threshold mode. So actually, it's probably fine. Don't worry about it. <laughs> I think it works fine. So let's do this. And then what, one thing is we'll need a silence class. Okay, so silence. Everybody silence? So. Okay, so train. And now let's try. So like silence. Let's ooh. Ooh. Uh, get the idea. Now let's clap. So you see what it's doing, right? It's able to predict the category of sound. So what can we do with that? Well, one funny thing we can do is play video games. Um, so, so for example, one video game that we can play is the T-Rex game. Right? So everybody knows this game? So how are we going to connect the audio classifier to, to the T-Rex? So the way we can do that is using uh, another application here called Keyboard OSC which will allow us to control the keyboard. And actually, let me just make sure this isn't running because my computer's going to go crazy. All right, so Keyboard OSC is an application that basically does phantom keystrokes for you. And this is a keyboard game. So basically, if we go to the settings, and we'll say that we, we want, okay, one, one will be the space bar, yeah. Two, class two will be left, class three will be right, and then pass just means don't do anything, that's four. Silence is cast. So basically, what we're going to do is, when you hit the space bar, it makes the T-Rex jump. Okay, so we can leave that as, uh, we can leave that. And, so we'll go allow keyboard simulation. And then we'll go back to this. And let's, let's actually, okay, so are you guys ready? Basically, when the T-Rex starts running, and we'll hit the volume threshold, threshold mode, when the T-Rex starts running, we all have to clap to make the T-Rex jump. Okay? And are you guys ready? Yeah. Okay. Wait, hold on, hold on, hold on. Chill out, chill out. Oh! <laughs> that, was really, that was really difficult. Oh! All right, we'll get there. Oh. Oh. You gotta go a little early, I think. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's not that early. <laughs> Who jumped the gun there? <laughs> oh, that was tough. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, maybe, maybe we'll make the threshold just a little bit higher. Okay. <laughs> That was that was decent. That was decent. High score of sixty-five. We'll do it faster. Than that. Here we go. Oh, uh, that's rough. I don't know. We gotta calibrate this a little better. Oh, I know why. Because this is too long. Let's do it again. One thirty-five. Now. Yeah, yeah. Military. Excellent. We, we broke the score, 93. Okay. All right, great. Okay, guys, that was that was wonderful. That was that was actually just a warm up. All right, really, the main event is Tetris. We're gonna play Tetris. No, that's crazy. Tetris, that's actually crazy. We'll we'll start with something a little simpler. Super Mario Kart. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, I think it's this one. Yes. Oh, we need Flash. Oh, horrible. Yes. Hang on a second. Initializing. Come on, come on, come on. Uh, what? Open, open, open. Oh, Flash, still a thing. It's install. Oh, uh, in uh, I think it's like this. Yes. yes. Yeah. 
that's fine. That's probably fine. Okay. And then once that is done, we can play Super Mario Kart. So who knows Super Mario Kart? Best game of all time, right? All right. <laughs> um, okay, so I guess we have to... Okay, now we'll go back to this. I think we have to restart. Okay. Mario Kart. Yes, run Adobe Flash. Allow. Okay, so now, here's how this is going to work. So basically, silence is nothing. So I, I'm going to hold down the gas. And ooh goes left, and ah goes right. So that's a, and silence goes straight. Right? So, so in the beginning, don't ooh or ah, because we're going to be going straight. All right, we got to complete one lap. One lap. Right. <laughs> so, okay, you guys ready? So, got it. Uh, sorry? Who is left? Ah is right. Yeah. So now we will uh, hit predict thing. Clap is nothing. Oops. What? What's going on here? Okay. Who are we gonna be? Ooh. <laughs> Ooh. I was gonna pick it randomly. Yoshi? <laughs> Alright, well, let's, uh, we'll do the princess. Yes! Okay, here we go. Alright, ready? Oh, it's just. What? I thought we were doing a Grand Prix. Alright, that's fine. <laughs> Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> wait, 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 I know why. I know why. We need to make this. Uh, oh, we don't need right. No threshold, and then something like that. Okay. Ooh. Ooh. Uh, you get the idea. Uh, another thing is you can save the models and load them. So that's all things that you can do. I've done this like like uh, my favorite game is F Zero. I've done. I've tried Tetris, but that's a disaster. Absolute disaster. Um, so, so you get the idea. So that's audio classifier. Um, you can have audio classifier send OSC. So you can also send it to processing. You know, Maximus P, or open frameworks, all that. Okay, um, I think that's all of the ones that I wanted to show you here. So let's go back to the slides. And then, uh, I think we were... Yes. Right, okay. So yeah, t um, these are all the tools that you can use to, to do interactive stuff. So uh, we didn't look at ML5 yet. I'll, I'll maybe I'll link you to some stuff with ML5, but we won't cover it today. And obviously, Open Frameworks Processing, Weaponator, P5, all fair game. We'll talk about Runway uh, tomorrow next week. And, uh, oh, Doodle Classifier, I wanted to show you that as well, uh, which might be a little complicated, but this one, um, yeah, let me, let me show you Doodle Classifier. So Doodle Classifier is very similar to Image Classifier, except the way it works is basically, like, we're going to draw stuff on a paper, and, yeah, okay. So, basically, the idea with Doodle Classifier is that you can train it to, to recognize objects. So, for example, there's three classes here. You can see that we have circle, um, star, arrow, right? Now, we can change that. You can actually, like, if you open, if you go to change settings, localhost, 8000, that's where the OSC is going, classification. 
you can change these to whatever you want. So like maybe we want, you know, circle, arrow, star, square, um, and uh, I don't know, like, well, that, that's good enough. Four plus is fine. So we'll change that. And what is that? Number of camera, yeah. So what I'm going to do is we're going to train these first on the circle. So I'm going to change out this. I'm going to draw a bunch of circles, basically. Um, I don't have enough paper really to do this. <laughs> I guess, uh, actually, yeah, I do. This will work. So let's draw some circles. Okay, so it's finding these circles on the right. So you have to calibrate the computer vision, the CV stuff. There's a tutorial on how to do this a little bit, like online. So if you, so some of the finer points I'm going to kind of gloss over, but you do, to calibrate the CV, you know, there's some, there's some sliders here that you can use. So okay, like four circles is enough. I'm going to hit uh, add samples. Okay, so samples are added. There they are. These are all circles. So now... Um, I will move these to the side and make, I'll change this to arrow and we'll draw some arrows. Okay, so, like that. Okay, there's some arrows. Let's see what I wanted to do. There we go. So five arrows come up on the rightmost thing there. And then we'll... Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So you're seeing those come up here. So we got five arrows. Uh, now we will switch to stars. Let's draw some stars. Okay, got a bunch of stars here. The so you see the the CD is a little bit off, so it's we need to maybe take this, make the max area a little smaller. Yeah, there we go. So now, uh, put these down here. yeah, I don't want to get any spurious things in view. And now we will hit add samples. Oh, and not have my hand in there. There's, oops, we got some weirdness. That's my skin. Okay, so now I'll go, finally, we'll hit, go to square, and I'll make some squares. Oh, but I don't want to have these in view, so let me kind of do this. Okay, there's, there's a bunch of squares. Now hit add samples. And there's squares. So now I hit train, and it trains. It trains actually quite quickly, um, or it should have. And now we can do this. Now we can basically run it. So now what I can do is like, I'll make a bunch of like here's a star, arrow, circle, square. Um, so I've got all four of them in here. So now I can hit um, classify. So now it'll pick all four of those up. And there you go. Predicted arrow, predicted star, predicted circle, predicted square. And what happens is that it sends it, sends the classifications over OSC to localhost 8000. Right? So basically we can actually look at this in processing this and have it loaded. So we just change this to 8000. So it'll receive here, and um, I forget how the message is formatted. There's an instruction page that shows it, but we can just read the message. So print line. Uh, who knows how to like like diag like read the whole message? It's like message dot. There's some sort of like message dot print something like that. I forgot maybe, but okay. Let's let's see. Let's run this and hit this again, and it should show up in the console if we did it right. So hit classify. Yeah, there it is. So yeah, it received classification. So it received four of them, or five of them actually, because we got a, we got a spurious thing there. 
So you got to calibrate a little bit, but okay, we got five messages. And each of them, if you take out the arguments, it's the class number. So, and you can have it running persistently. So if you click run, it'll just start like doing it as fast as it can. So you can kind of move them around. It also sends the, um, the position, I think. And um, so what can you do with this, right? There's a lot of things you can do. I'll show you a few things that you can do with it. Um, one cool thing you can do if I have, um, I have, uh, I can find it online. So this is a project that I made with Andreas Refsgaard. It's a collaborator of mine who's actually gonna be here in March. We're gonna, we're gonna have him over for AI Lab. And we made this project with Doodle Classifier where we basically, you draw musical instruments on paper and then the camera recognizes them and it sends it and, and then sends that signal to Ableton. So you, it plays whatever instruments you draw. Yeah, it's a, it's really the same thing as we we've seen already. Like it just does. We trained it to do it. Like you know, the only difference is that it does this cropping thing first to identify it. Uh, so it's just a little bit more of a complicated version of Kubla. Just a base. Yeah, totally. Uh, yeah, I, it may be a little too much for this model, but, but uh, or, or this architecture, like this is a massive data set. Like I haven't tried 1,000 categories yet. I mean, in principle, in theory, like yeah, it, it may, yeah, maybe it needs some refinement, but yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. Oh yeah. Oh, they, oh. So they made that using this. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. They directly they used um they used Doodle class fire. So I know the guy who made it. Oh, they used Doodle yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. 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 So that that project is exactly made with this. Yeah. Um. So then another thing that um uh, another cool thing you can do with it. I have uh I have an article. That, yes, in here, one class that I've had, they did ma basically make music with it. Actually, you know what? This is just using Cubnet Predictor, not Doodle Classifier, but similar kind of idea. So there's a camera looking down at the sandbox, and they make different patterns. The sand. Yeah, it's making some cool edit music. So lots of lots of creative things that we can do. I'll give you all a punchline to this in just a uh, few moments. Like I wanna I wanna kind of so we're basically done the demo. So let me go back to the slides. I wanna show you some more um yeah, maybe maybe we'll, we'll should have a little bit of time to get into general models, not as much as I had hoped for, but oh yeah, this is this is Andres's former collaborator, Lassi, and he's playing Tetris. So this Tetris works a lot better with one person, because like you you all would disagree on on where to put the pieces. So like it makes sense with car racing because everyone can see clearly like left or right. But with this, this would just be madness. Like uh, you know, where should we put this piece? Um so so yeah, Tetris. Another cool thing, like we have a, um, uh, so a, 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 um, a former student of, of Andreas uh, did this at CID, where he basically like hooked up um, the image classifier to a device that turns lights on or off. I think I showed this just last week, right? So you guys saw this, right? Mm -hmm. um, can I hug that? I think I showed this also, right? Like the, oh, maybe not. Okay, there's someone put this online, like training a classifier to, to recognize if things are huggable. So stuffed animals and teddy bears are huggable and chainsaws are not. Um, 
this is a, actually a former student here. I don't know if any of you know him. Uh, uh, Chino was one of my students in 2016. Um, so I guess he was here before before you guys were a student here. But he was a resident last year. Oh, he was a resident last year. That's right. So anyway, he made a really cool project where basically he's got these glasses that fog beta blockers, as they're called. They they fog up. They, you can make them fog up, and so basically he makes them fog up whenever you look at a screen. So block your your vision of screens. Um, Piano Die Hard is also made by students of mine, and, and maybe you guys know Aaron. I think he was also a resident here, right? Um, not sure if you know Corbin. I think he he graduated a while ago, so I'm not sure if he's here anymore. Anyway, they made this piano that basically has like a mechanical arm, and then it would watch the movie Die Hard. Yeah, and whenever there's an explosion detected, it would start the piano would start vigorously playing itself. <laughs> so, um, Neural Recycle also uh, not a student of mine, but he was an IXP student here. Um, basically, it just detects if objects are recyclable or not. So you trained it to detect cans and paper and you know things like that. And, it, and otherwise, it would detect trash, so trash or recycling. He made it uh, classify iPhones as trash. Yeah. Um, oh, two slides, same thing. Reverse image search is sort of built on the same thing. I want to skip this because we're kind of running low on time. This is what Audio TC looks like. And I, I wish I had a video, but I don't have it in the slides. You can do TCN on anything. So like TCN on text as well, doc, art, art, uh, document articles. I have a, note, a notebook that shows you how to do this. Um, so for anyone who wants to investigate the text. So basically, like all of this stuff, the resources, if you if you get interested in any individual one, all of them have instructional guides. Some of them may, like, like occasionally you might find things that are out of date. There's just a few of us maintaining this, but I'm here. So like if, if any of you are interested in this and want to want to use them and, and are having any trouble with the guides or, or the demos, can you just book office hours with me and I'll show you how to use it. Um, but and also this video just showed me do a lot of them from scratch. So even though I was going fast, it's like the, the brilliant thing about videos that you can pause it and, <laughs> and, and practice. So um, the guides and the demos and the ML Fray have most of these things on there. The demos are actually all using mostly not not all but mostly using ML5. And ML5 of course is a great project that we have going on here to do stuff with TensorFlow.js. Um, you just see how we're doing in time. Yeah, the, the, and then you can find some ML5 demos also here. Um, so like, for example, playing Pong online. The Pong was made by Alejandro, um, and, uh, and then we just basically added ML5 to it. So it looks like this. Play with my face. It's actually quite difficult, um, but yeah. Um, okay, so this brings us to generative models. Let me just back up here. So it's 2.20, we have 20 minutes. So what I want to do, because we don't have enough time to really talk about these in depth, so what I'm going to do, let me just think about this. Um, so I'll introduce generative models, and then we'll just see how far we get, and then we'll continue it basically next week. Um, let me just, before we change, because we're changing gears altogether into a new topic, and we'll preview it now, and then we'll talk about it more deeply next week. But um, for the stuff that we just looked at, all of these... Um, uh, interactive demos, what do they have to, the question might be like, we should remember, what do, what do these all have to do with the class, right? Because because I, I, I constantly have to remind you guys and myself that our, ideally we're trying to create an autonomous artificial artist, which is like this art project by all of us, right? Well, um, one, um, one sort of strategy for doing that is to create multiple sort of small interactive scenarios which can interact with each other. Right, can send data over a network. So you, you know, you think about the Rube Goldberg machine. Imagine a Rube Goldberg machine. Everyone knows what that is, right? Should we find the Rube Goldberg machine on YouTube? So I really love those. Like, do they have competitions for those? They must. Right? We made one last year. Oh, really? Okay. Is there a class that's just for doing that? No, it was for. That's a perfect ICB class, right? <laughs> Someone's got to run that Rube Goldberg class. But yeah, you guys made one. Yeah. How big was it? Uh, it was on the Huh. Yeah. I saw one recently that did like this reverse domino trick, like where it, it looks like physically impossible. It, you know, you see the dominoes falling over, but except this was set up in a way where it looks like it's like the dominoes are jumping up. It's like really, really <laughs> mind blowing. But anyway, like imagine we have an audio classifier. That's just as an example, that is, you know, driving something in the browser or something like that, and then the browser itself. You know, you have a game in the browser, and then the game in the browser has outcomes, and then those outcomes 
can then be plugged into another another sort of installation, which is you know you, you see where I'm going. You can hook, you can you can daisy chain multiple interactive scenarios that all kind of control each other, maybe in a cycle or a graph. Like you can have this. You can basically make a Frankenstein installation, right? It's like where all of these different components are all hooked up together. And, th and this is ultimately, I think, uh, the way that we're going to begin building this thing is going to try to <coughs> create individual things and then begin to slowly grow them by, by combining, by congealing them together, kind of, so that they're interacting with each other and then slowly growing out a sort of Frankenstein installation. The, the Frankenstein installation is kind of the, the first and most straightforward way of building an art project that involves all of us. Ultimately, I'd love for it to not be not be Frankenstein, but be but be um, uh, be the scientist who made Frankenstein. Who was the Doctor Frankenstein? Doctor Frankenstein. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah. It's not, it's the, yeah, exactly. Yeah, right. So, um, in the sense that 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 like when when you have a Frankenstein, you can see each of the components, but eventually we want to see, not see the components and see only the whole. But that's a lot more complicated. Um, so I'm I'm gonna try out a few like experiments that might that might kind of that's why I was asking about the processing thing earlier today, like sending images, and I'll I'll wanna ask about that again. But that might be actually a way to well I'll I'll get I'll get back to that next week. But basically like the the straightforward way is a Frankenstein of many installations, um, which which can be worked out by groups. And the 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 most high-level way, or let's say the most ambitious way, would be where we're, where we kind of have this melting pot, where all of the things that we just put into a big melting pot, and we get this one installation that no one can really see their own component in. It's just this big sort of like fusion. Um, so we're, it's like if we took a Rube Goldberg machine and then melted it in a microwave or something like that. Um, and so I don't know. Basically, so. And, and also, we want the thing to be interactive, right? So maybe we'll make a room size installation in here, and it'll have lots of lights and sound and everything. Uh, but we also want it to be interactive, right? So maybe we'll have cameras and microphones and, and things that I can't even think of, right? Because everyone here is making all kinds of stuff, right? And the great thing about machine learning is that you can, you can plug in anything you want. Like, whatever it is that you're working on is going to be relevant here. So bring your dissertation projects into this room. Like, they'll be relevant. Um, we can totally like congeal them, right? So, so that's the that's the goal. And so, interactive stuff. We're gonna we're gonna shift gears and talk about generative models now, which are a little different. But we'll see that we can control generative models with <coughs> interactively. Um, does anyone have any questions? Okay. Um, and let me also just quickly. So we have like not very much time, but enough time to. So I've got. Okay, so there's uh, about 116 slides, and uh, so I'll I'll do just the first few of them basically, and then we'll leave most of this for next week, and then um, and, and let me also make sure we do the last slide. So, okay, so this is this is going to be just like a gentle introduction. Like I'm just going to talk about these for about 15 minutes, and then and then we'll adjourn, and then we'll do most of this actually next week. Um, yeah. Well, basically, yeah. We're not we're not gonna do too much of these, but I just want to I just want to introduce you to the idea, and then we'll cover these in more depth next week. So, what are generative models? Um, I, I mentioned it briefly last week, but we didn't talk about it in much detail. Again, I'll mention it briefly. Uh, but basically, generative models are neural networks that are uh, kind of special. Um, they're well, they don't have to be neural networks. But most of the ones that we're using for generative models are neural networks because they happen to work very well. A generative model, in the most general sense, is any model of a data set which is generative, obviously. Uh, generative in the sense that it can generate samples of data that look like they came from that data set, right? So let's say you have a data set of images of dogs. A generative model would be a model of dogs that is able to synthesize new dogs, right? Now, um, these images are totally fake, right? So this is not a real dog. Um, this is not a real island or a real mushroom um, or a real bubble um, or a real coffee cup. You can tell because like this glass is kind of weird, isn't it? Like, you can, there's sort of like there's little tells that, that generative model artifacts give. Um, but 
but they're getting increasingly realistic, right? And they're very interesting because, because, and certainly interesting for me because of the reasons that I mentioned last week, I'm really interested into this idea of the collective unconscious, like the collective imagination. And, and if we pull all of our images together, uh, which hopefully we will do, um, we can create a generative model of our, like, our consciousness, basically. Um, I'll make a better case for this when I have more time, but, but the idea is that these allow us to, to imagine as all of us, right? Because we're pulling all of our data together and then learning a mathematical function that represents it. And so um, generative models are, are really interesting to scientists for many reasons. Um, well, okay, they're, they're interesting for two categories of reasons, let's say. One is that they have a lot of amazing applications, right? So generative models, firstly, can be used to create content, right? So you can, if you have a generative model of, of video game graphics, then you can, you can create video games with graphics automatically. You don't have to design them all by hand. And, and the fact that you don't have to design them all by hand um, is not just great because of the labor saving, it's great because that means that you can potentially generate things on the fly that you didn't anticipate beforehand, right? That's the brilliant thing about generative models is that they, they automate a process that's, that's manual and then therefore can be deployed in lots of scenarios that didn't used to be possible, right? Um, generative models have all sorts of other applications that are very, like, um, very important to scientists so, and, and engineers like language models, right? So chatbots, uh, your personal assistants, the Google duplexes that call pizza restaurants and so on. Did anyone see that? Um, those are all generative models. Those are generative models of language. They can generate language, right? It's not just generating images. It's also generating sentences, generating audio, um, generating basically anything that, that can be described by numbers. Um, generative models also have like all sorts of accessibility applications. So you can imagine using all, the, all those things to, for example, because some, okay, some generative models are not just generating things from scratch, but also they converting things, right? So converting text into an image, right? So for, um, so for example, um, or image to text, right? So <clears throat> if, you're, uh, if you're blind and you could, you could do like, you can basically, well, maybe that's just a neural network that reads stuff, but, but okay, like let, let's think about it the other way, like text to image, right? You can, um, or audio to image, let's say, if you can't hear something, you can generate a book directly from the text or something like that. You can imagine all sorts of, the point is that you can change media. Go from audio to, to text or text to audio, text to images, image to text and so on. Um, there's a lot of applications for reinforcement learning. So in re, we haven't talked about reinforcement learning. Reinforcement learning is this branch of machine learning that's all concerned about creating uh, agents that interact with the world, right? Because all the neural networks that we looked at so far, they're kind of static. You know, they kind of look at an image and tell us something about it. But we want to also build things that, that work inside of the real world, like robots and things like that, right? And agents have to, have to imagine. They have to, they have to simulate. It's what we do, right? Like when, you, and when you're deciding how you're going to plan your day, you imagine each of these different scenarios, and then you decide which one is better. So you kind of do these, you simulate. You simulate your future, basically, many versions of it. And then you decide on one that, you, that seems like best at the time. So reinforcement learning applications are very, very much like uh, uh, complementary to, to general models. Um, they, uh, they also like, like so in the last one, explaining a modeling phenomena, this is very much captured by the Richard Feynman quote, which I really, really love. Richard Feynman, of course, the famous physicist, what I cannot create, I do not understand. Right? So the idea is that by learning to create something, you're actually learning to understand it. Um, so, like, if you can if you can model the climate, you can understand it better, right? So, a lot of a lot of climate modeling is just general models of climate. Um, and then, obviously, like the last one, which is the most relevant to us, is that it creates all sorts of awesome music and art. And to me, I, I would add the sixth one. This is not necessarily an application, but but this whole connection to the collective imagination is the one that that I'm kind of trying to articulate slowly, trying to figure out exactly what I mean by that, but. <laughs> but that's that's basically um, that's basically the, why it's interesting to scientists. So what are they exactly? Um, a generative model can be loosely described as basically a representational model of a data set, and the model can be implemented as a neural network. And um, you can think of it as kind of modeling the probability of any possible x, right? 
So we've seen these neural networks that go x to y, right? And x is, x is a combination of pixels, or it's a combination of audio samples, or it's a combination of words, right? And so uh, x is this, it comes from this whole space of, of uh, possible images, right? So if, let's say, your, your network is trained on images of faces, right? And those images are, let's say, 30 by 30 pixels, then each of these images are drawn from a, uh, a 900 pixel distribution. So every possible image that can be made with 900 pixels, right? Well, most of the possible images that you can make with 900 pixels are randomness, right? Just random colors, random, there's no patterns at all, right? So most possible images are junk. They're just white noise, right? Um, but some of them are faces, right? And so the idea is that if you're modeling images of faces, you want to generate a model which attaches a high probability to things like this, you know, to, to images like this, and low probability to just random noise, right? And you can learn that distribution using, um, using different kinds of neural networks, right? And almost all of them take the following architecture. Basically, you have some F, which is a neural network, and it takes in some... A neural network always has to have an input and an output, right? So it always has an input and output. And in this case, the input is actually basically some vector of numbers called Z. And we'll talk about what Z signifies exactly. But for now, in the most simple generic sense, Z is just random numbers, basically. It's just, it's just fairy dust, basically. And it goes into this neural network, and poof, out comes the other side, comes fake images of faces, or cars, or cats, or whatever. Um, and um, so these are, well, that's really awesome, right? It's super fun. And, um, and yeah, so that usually it's like a random, random input vector filled of you know, random numbers, basically. Um, and the more mathematical view is a little bit out of scope for us, but for those of you who are interested in math, it's basically trying to match, like, like if there is some true distribution from which the samples are actually sampled from, we're trying to basically find a generative model that matches that distribution. And you can read, there's a really nice blog post about this from OpenAI um, that, talks, uh, that talks about generative models and explains them very nicely. I think it's, a, it's very much worth reading. The link is right there. Uh, oh, and they're in contrast with what we might call a discriminative model, right? And discriminative model, discriminate, right? The idea, discrimination, classification, right? Um, in, in this, and we mean this in a very technical sense, discriminate being classified. This is object A or object B or object C, right? And so like class, classification and regression are discriminative models. So you might hear that sometimes in scientific terminology. There's kind of, I'll, I'll leave aside the details for now. I'll just say like there's kind of two major categories of these that, that you'll see, uh, autoencoders, um, which basically are neural networks that, that, that learn a sort of representation of, Im uh, of images through this process of compression and decompression. I'm, I'm going to go into more of these details next week, or to the extent that we need them actually, so we may not really look at the details too much, but, but, um, but for now just like remember autoencoders and remember um, uh, you could do really fun things like with autoencoders. So this is a great Twitter account called Smile Vector, made by this guy Tom White, which puts smiles on things, basically. <laughs> um, and then he did the same. He made one for me. This is an autoencoder like that was initially. Um, so one of these is my face, I think. Um, I think the. I think this was basically the. The, the um, decoded version of my face. So my, my face, you get the Z code from it, and then you, I, anyway, I'll talk about it later. And then you can kind of make modifications to it, you know. So we can do all sorts of funny things with faces. And so uh, generative adversarial networks, these are, these are, get a lot more of the attention. And they're kind of similar to autoencoders, except they have a sort of weird setup that involves two neural networks that are sort of jointly trained in, in, a, in a, something of a competition with each other. I'll talk about this a little bit more next week, but let me just show you some cool things that you can do with them. You can do feature arithmetic, so you can do like, you can put smiles on people's faces. Um, this is like even old stuff, you can put glasses on things. You can do arithmetic, like man with glasses minus man plus woman equals woman with glasses. Um, you can generate bedrooms, album covers, um, faces, 
Um, this is a project that I made with the original DC Gen. Uh, basically, it was generating ch Chinese characters. Right, so these are all completely synthetic characters made by a neural network that's been trained to look at you know millions of characters. You can do interpolations between the characters. So this is a project that I made that, that if anyone's interested in it, you can, you can see that neural networks have come a long way since then. So these are like the original ones that just worked on like 30 pixels at a time. So kind of worked nicely for small images. Um, flowers and manga characters, these are some projects made by, made by some other people. Um, a project made by your cohort here, Sam Haynes. So Sam was a, a student of mine a few, a few years ago before he was here. And he did this thing where he basically downloaded, which we now have in the computer downstairs because he gave it to me. He has this data set of scraped images from Instagram which have no likes. Um, so, ba so basically he trained a generative model on unliked Instagram photos. And then he made a Twitter account that would post random ones. So it's the saddest Twitter account in the world basically. It's called Zero Likes. And, um, and then he used another neural network to caption it. So basically, like, it would take a caption and go, man takes a picture of himself. <laughs> and you can kind of see, like, you know, it looks like a selfie kind of thing going on, right? Um, and um, it even learns the cheesy Instagram filters, things like that. So it's really funny. Okay, I'm running out of time. So let me, let me show you, like, one last thing. This is what they look like now, right? So this is some work by NVIDIA in late 2017. You can see how far they came come since 2015. Very, very realistic looking faces. And they released a, 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 um, they released a code to go with this and the pre-trained models. Um, and we can train, so the code to train these is actually reasonably reasonable for the machine downstairs. So it, these are super heavy neural networks they, they, um, that, that like one GPU would take a month to train to this. Four GPUs take a few days on the data set. So we can actually make, like I'm planning, I'm probably using the updated version of this to train a gigantic image uh, data set that we'll all assemble together, basically. And it'll take, a, it's gonna, it's, it'll be it's serious, it'll be very high, high definition, as you can see, and it'll be like basically like whatever we want it to be. And actually, like this, this has been updated literally this week. So they released a new thing called StyleGAN. I don't even have slides for it, but I just posted something on Twitter, basically. So StyleGAN lets you do like, um, where can I, I don't have this on there. So StyleGAN can basically do like style transfer. So basically, look at this. This is, so basically, so you can generate the model and then you could do like a style transfer on top of them. Isn't that neat? <laughs> so we're gonna use this. We're gonna make much better looking images. And then, okay, like different cars. Oh, and then actually the thing that makes the most sense is doing like style transfer on faces. So basically you take this face and you restyle it with this one. So you get the idea? Yeah. So we're going to be able to do all sorts of like, all sorts of crazy stuff. Um, and for my part, the original one from 2017, I trained on wiki art. And so this is what I was able to do on a data set of 100,000 paintings. Oh, this is a joke. I was just looking for faces. But anyway, let's skip that. Yeah, Mother Teresa and Ryan Angel. Oh, yeah. So these are some of the models that NVIDIA released. So the phone, the cars, the bikes, the cats. Um, you could get memes. Like, this is great. Yeah, right. Um, and, then, and then actually some other people trained these on other things. So like... This was trained on noodles, I guess, or Chinese food. Oh, there's a data set of Chinese food online, which is absolutely enormous. There's like four million images. I'm not even, I'm not even kidding. Four million images of Chinese food. So that would be also a good candidate to train one of these on. Um, and then Andreas uh, trained it on eyes. Right? And then I trained it on, uh, oh, this guy, Robbie Barrett, he trained it on nude paintings. So those are nude paintings. Uh, and then this is trained on all of WikiArt, right? So this I made basically like six months ago, and it's just WikiArt's a generative model of paintings. And you see that it has things that look like abstract and paint and, and, and portraits and faces and all sorts of stuff. These are just some of the highlights. So I'm going to talk about these in much more detail. We don't have. I'm going to skip some of this now, and we'll we'll kind of talk about some of these next week. 
I just want to skip to the next to the last slide. Okay, so here's the here's the idea for next week. Um, so what I want to do is kind of like begin to. So we'll, we'll first of all we'll introduce generative models, and I'll pro, and I'll try to show you some tutorials on how we can train them. Ultimately, we're going to train them together basically. So so we'll kind of see how we want to factor in the tutorials. I also want to show you runway, but actually. Um, Come to AI Lab tomorrow because I'm going to do runway uh, demos at AI Lab, and for everybody, for anyone who wants to come to, for that, that's going to be at five tomorrow. I'll send, I'll have them send an email about that. Um, so we'll start doing runway tutorials, and then what I'm planning to do is I want to start to, I want to start to make a class interactive, like, and maybe like we can start to ideate, like, like basically. So all of the things that we looked at, right? All of these interactive demos. Um, start thinking, and you don't even have to make them yet. Just start coming up with ideas of interactive machine learning guided projects that you can make. And next week, what we'll do is we'll, we'll, we'll try to have some, what we'll try to do is we'll present those ideas and then we'll just brainstorm ways of connecting them. And uh, also, like, I'm totally, if you actually bring prototypes, like if you make a small demo, like you can show it here. So let's, let's also make as much building, like, Bring ideas if you have them. Even better is if you make a prototype of that idea. Um, and try to bring multiple ideas and then we'll actually just go through them. Like one thing that Andreas and I do in our workshops is we'll have these like flashcard sessions where we just put up as many ideas as we, as we can and then people talk to each other about the ideas and then we get rid of like 50% of them and then talk about them again and get rid of 50% of them. And usually this is a way of finding ideas that will be as complementary as possible. Um, so that's the idea. Bring some, bring some uh, ideas and and prototypes if you can, and 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 come to office hours if you want to show me some of them. Is there a question? Yeah. Can I just focus on more like modular and relational ideas, or things bigger and more uh, you know, like, like wider contexts, or things that we think will be individually or smaller groups? Um, I think both are fine right now. I would say like like. Because we don't know yet exactly what this is going to be, so so bring just like fo focus more on ideas that that are just interesting, like ultimately, um, and you know like and, and okay like the, the first thing like if they're able to be modular enough to interact with others, then that's probably a good thing. Yeah. Are there any other questions? Okay, cool. So let's wrap it up today and uh, come to AI Lab tomorrow. Uh, book office hours with me if you want to show me some stuff. Um, I'll be in, you know, most days and you can book them on the calendar thing. Or you can also email me. And um, so that's all. Cool. See you guys. And I'll, I'll put this online uh, and send you guys, when, when this is done, I'll put this, I'll, I'll, it'll be ready for you guys.